Okay, uh, my name is Paul Seligson. Um, I'm a freelance teacher, trainer, consultant, anything you like in ELT really. And uh, I'm based in Brighton in the UK and I've been kindly invited to Santiago for, I think it's the fifth time now and I'm sponsored by Richmond Publishing and it's very kind of them to bring me here. I love it here. <laughs> difficult to know where to begin really and <laughs> I mean I've been teaching for ooh, over 38 years and um, I'm lucky really because I've sort of came in just as the communicative thing was beginning and um, was able really to sort of um, not come with too much grammatical baggage and so um, I've been always able to see the thing I think mainly from the students perspective and it seems to me what they want the language for is, 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 is really to express their own personality and that hasn't changed and um, uh, I often ask teachers what, what comes first in language learning is it um, accuracy or fluency and it's really quite an interesting question because most, most teachers automatically go for accuracy but actually it's fluency if you think about a child learning it's mama, mama leche and so on it sort of slowly slowly grows and um, fluency does come first and we, we need to remember that when we're sort of banging away on our drills and, and grammatically focused tests so I, I, I'm hoping that's going to emerge uh, into the future much more with the uh, obvious growth of ELF, English as a lingua franca, 80% of the conversations of English in the world now don't evolve native speakers, we know the numbers, but effectively it's less and less about what a native might or might not say in a certain situation, but what will best work for you in, in your ability to express yourself, your, your, your work needs, your professional needs, your personal needs in the foreign language, which is English. I think that, that it's going to become more and more pragmatic, I'm sure of that. Um, the other thing I think is really interesting is that we've had international approaches, and I'm very much concerned with making things much more local. I and mean, if you're teaching Spanish speakers, and this is the subject of my plenary tomorrow, they have huge advantages over uh, learners from a more exotic background, shall we say, from an Asian language background. And you know, there are so many words in common, similar grammar, and so on. And we ought to be able to sort of uh, allow this cross fertilization between languages to accelerate learning for our students. So, I believe here in Chile, it shouldn't be that difficult for our learners to get up to a B1 level relatively fast, as compared with many other other learners. I think what's interesting now is that projects were, were the big thing in the 80s and 90s and it seems to be coming back and the, the, the idea of you know, now go off and Google something related to the grammar, the, the lexis, the topic, whatever, uh, and more and more and more. My suspicion is that course books ought to get thinner and have a lot more sort of Google type tasks. So, so that you set something up, there's a model there, and whether they've got the model from the book or a flipped input at the beginning of the class and then using the class to practice. At some point, what's inevitable now is that the students will go and seek, go and look for something which you are into, which connects to what we're supposed to be studying. So it's going to be a much more student-led process, I believe, whether you're following a course book or not. In the end, I'm, I'm convinced that if we, less is more in language teaching. And we need really to look at this sort of the racetrack that course books have become and, and slow things down. It might be a good idea to use the same book for two years rather than one year, for example, and, and, and allow the students to sort of use that as a springboard to, to effectively teach each other. And my suggestion this afternoon will be that they do this much more with, with lines from songs, for example. I think the, the, the thing that I've learned over the years is that you need to begin with the students and you have really to put yourselves in their shoes. You know, what do they know? They know Spanish. They may know some English. What English have they picked up? It could be from music, from um, Netflix. It could be from anywhere. But they, they're not coming to your classes empty. And I think if you could always, whether you're beginning with kids or teens or adults, they all have some connected prior knowledge and one of the tenets of language teaching is build upon prior knowledge as opposed to assuming empty and my, re my feeling is that if you're able to sort of think well actually they know this, they've seen this, they might have heard this, they're familiar with this and then you couple that up with the potential of, of the internet to sort of google things 
you've got a very rich, fertile land there to build upon, no matter who you're teaching. Uh, and, and hopefully we're, we ought to be able to tailor better, more individualised classes, even though we're still lead, often teaching quite large groups. There's an awful lot there which they can bring to the party. Uh, but I still think the other thing I wanted to mention was that we're, every conference I go to, there's an obsession with the, you know, tech. The, you know, the tech teachers are sort of screaming, you could do this and you could do that. But you know, my plea still is good classroom management is still the essence of teaching. It's all about how you manage the group, how you're able to involve as many people as much as possible throughout the class. And so tech is fabulous, but in the end, our teacher training colleges will need to focus on how do you manage the room, the group, and bring forth and allow the students to flower together collectively as quickly as possible. So the individualization married with the group management thing is what most interests me. Well, I mean, in, the, in the old days, in my, you know, when I had hair and was younger, <laughs> it was an event when, you, brought, when you, you came to class and said, guys, we have a song, and, and everybody got euphoric because it was better than what was in the course book. Uh, and these days you come in and say, guys, we've got to go a song, and they go, big deals. You know, I've got 30,000 songs in my phone. You know. So you, it's much more about picking and choosing and, and connecting little bits, the hooks, the melodies, the lines which everybody knows. It's, what I believe is if you bring in lines of songs, just little bits, you can have quantity and quality. What happens with a full song is half the class hate the song, and it's a battle. And also then the other thing which perhaps I was talking about this last week in, in Braz Tiesel is um, the thing you hear most from teachers is, I don't have time, I don't have time. I don't have time because our syllabus is a, you know, what I call silly buses. You know, they're just, they're sort of, they're, they're too, they're over crammed with things. And you, you're never going to squeeze in full songs, but you can squeeze in lots and lots and lots of little lines, which are, to my mind, existing knowledge and perfect models of pronunciation and a great source of authentic listening.